Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. <laughs> Welcome to our Sabbath service. No. <laughs> it is so good to see everybody here. Um, we're going to start with a song, so let's kick it. Please stand. Oh, deep, way down deep. Way down, deep down in my heart, oh, deep, way down, deep, way down, deep down in my heart. I got the love of Jesus, I got the love of Jesus, I got the love of Jesus, and it's deep down in my heart, oh, deep. Way down deep, way down deep, down in my heart. Singing deep, way down deep, way down deep, down in my heart. I got the joy of Jesus. I got the joy of Jesus. I got the joy of Jesus, and it's deep down in my heart, oh, deep, way down deep, way down deep, down in my heart, oh, deep, down deep, way down deep, down in my heart, I got the peace of Jesus, I got the peace of Jesus, I got the peace of Jesus, and it's deep down in my heart. I got the love of Jesus. I got the joy of Jesus. I got the peace of Jesus, and it's deep down in my heart. And it's deep down in my heart. One more time, and it's deep down in my heart. Please be seated. Well, welcome. It is, as I said before, it is really wonderful to be here. I have been praying for months and months for the day that we could uh, come back, and I'm sure all of us have. Um, on the day that I found out that we were going to start meeting again in a few weeks, I just, I've been reading this Bible plan, and just that day, I just happened to come upon Second Chronicles 29 and 30, and I really wish I could take 10 minutes to just read the full two chapters here, but I don't have the time, but um, nope. I want to read <laughs> a little bit. In uh, Second Chronicles 29, it says that Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. He did right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. He brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them into the square on the east. Then he said to them, listen, O Levites, consecrate yourselves now and consecrate the house of the Lord and the God of your fathers and carry the uncleanness out from this holy place. Um, I'm going to skip down to verse uh, 35. Thus, the service of the house of the Lord was established again. Then Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced over what God had prepared for the people because the thing came about suddenly. I love this whole two chapters and you see the excitement in there and how people were crying because they had missed it and seeing what they had been left. No, I might cry. <laughs> I've cried a bunch of times praying about this over the last months. Um, so happy to be here. I thought I was going to hold it together. <laughs> but, um, and to see all of you, I can't wait till we're all together. Uh, and we have a bunch of singers back here covering up my mistakes. <laughs> but um, I'm just excited 
and I've never realized how much I would miss church. And now I think I got Heather crying too. Um, I better pray. <laughs> Holy God, we praise you. We thank you. We love you. We, we miss your body. We miss singing to you. We miss hugging each other. We miss everything. Father, I pray that you would protect us uh, and watch over us from any uh, uncleanness that the world is worried about right now, that we would put our trust in you, and that your, your hand, your spirit would be on us, and that you would make this a great time of praise to you, and, uh, and that every heart here can be lifted up, that the people who are going to watch at home tomorrow, their hearts will be lifted up by, by our praise to you. We, we're just so grateful for how you've seen us through, and uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Um, please stand. We got one song before uh, Matt comes up to do the message. You hear me when I call. You are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield, though troubles linger still. Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind The God of angel armies Is always by my side The one who reigns forever He is a friend of mine The God of angel armies Is always by my side My strength is in your name for you alone can save you will deliver me yours is the victory whom shall I fear whom shall I fear I know who goes before me I know who stands behind the God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. And nothing formed against me shall stand. You hold the whole world in your hand. I'm holding on to your promises. You are faithful. You are faithful. You are faithful. I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind The God of angel armies Is always by my side The one who reigns forever He is a friend of mine The God of angel armies Is always by my side I know who goes before me I know who stands behind the God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The God of angel armies is always by my side. So you're kind of like a studio audience because we're recording right now. So 
If you could all turn around and wave at the cameras, they can't see you. And now they can, if you want to stand up and say hi. So this is going to be our continuing online service. Uh, so if you come on Saturday night, you will be a part of the recording. Nice. On Sunday morning, we're going to go ahead and we'll remove this. The only reason that this television is in view is for the recording. And then uh, so it'll on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. and 1130, it'll be what you're what you're used to. Uh, but you'll also notice that you are uh, separated in, in a in orderly fashion to make sure that we're safe. Uh, so I appreciate everyone wearing their masks and really being attentive to that. Uh, the worst thing that could happen is uh, you come here and we have a breakout because of our church services. So please be careful, be respectful, be thoughtful uh, as we kind of get through the congregation. It's so hard not to hug and jump on each other and wrestle. Wait, that's me. But it's hard not to do that stuff. But, uh, you know, as Omar said, it has been a long time coming. Actually, the last time we had service was March 8th of last year. So it's been a whole year. And I remember I was looking on my, uh, my calendar and I saw the posting, service is canceled, Facebook Live. So I came here by myself. I'll never forget that. And I put my little phone up there, and I said, hey, everybody, we're Facebook Live, you know? And remember when those things would crash? Now go over to this, you know? And everybody's, like, going over to the other Facebook page, and what a mess. But how much we've grown in our online presence. Now we have, like, between three and 500 people that actually watch our service online. It's pretty cool. Uh, so God is, is moving, you know? He's doing really cool things. Secondly, I want you to kind of look around for a second. This is about the size of our church when we first moved in this building. So I kind of got a tingle up my spine. I remember ordering the chairs and this, you know, and I remember putting the chairs out. We didn't put them all out because we knew we didn't have as many people coming out. We didn't want to look like we didn't have nobody at church, you know. And this is about the crowd that we had. So what is God doing? I don't know, but I know that we have three services and we'll probably end up filling them all and who knows what's going to happen there, but... Uh, it is good to be together, guys. It's good to not be looking at a camera all the time. No, no offense, at home. But it's good to see warm bodies and uh, just your eyes, because I can't see your mouths because you have masks on. But that's okay. It's still good to see you. Um, you know, uh, I was also thinking about there is not another place on earth that I would rather be. This is the only place that makes sense to me. It is. You know, uh, speaking it into a camera, I, I'd leave and I would just cry sometimes. I'm like, <laughs> you know, because I'm not sure what people are thinking or what they're feeling and there was no interaction. I stopped telling jokes. Because no one's laughing. I'm like, how did I, that could have been a horrible joke. Even my bad jokes, I didn't like. You know, I'm like, I bagged it all. But, you know, that whole concept in Acts 2, everything in common. It's huge. I don't, think, I don't think we realize it until we miss it, until we don't have it, how important it is to walk in and be with those who feel the same way about God that you do. Because this is a tough place out there. You know, I mean, day in and day out, the, the world is vying for our attention. He's trying, you know, it's trying to get us off track. And when we come here, it's like, ah, oh, finally at a place that makes sense. Because everywhere else doesn't make sense. I wouldn't rather be anywhere else. You know, um, God and his family are my treasure. You are my treasure. This is what I've looked for my whole life. And this, it's right here. So I don't think I've appreciated it as much this last year. Being together for all those years of my Christian walk than when it's been taken away from me. And I haven't been able to. Now, you know, you have little pockets. You get together here and there. Midweeks, I get it. But there's something about when a congregation gets together, boom, you know. God is here. Um, so, welcome. <laughs> welcome. I'm glad that we can be together tonight. So, because it's not as many of us, I'll just need you to be a little bit louder. So, the online thinks that there's more of us. Okay, so laugh a little bit louder at my jokes. I'm just saying. Encourage me. You know what I mean? Let's just make sure they think there's hundreds of people at this service. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, so you're with me. So, jokes. How many tickles does it take 
to make an octopus laugh? Tentacles. 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 That was good, right? I've been saving these guys. I've been saving, digging deep. Okay. People think the word icy is the easiest word to spell. Come to think of it, I see why. Okay, louder, louder. No, I'm just kidding. What's a balloon's least favorite type of music? Pop. And for Laura, how does NASA organize a party? Oh, okay. I thought you were so smart you knew that answer. That one. They plan it. Oh, I felt good to tell some jokes. Okay. Yep. Okay, so we're going to continue our series uh, into the New Testament survey series. Hopefully, you've been enjoying that. Uh, it, it, it's been a great journey for me to go through every book, kind of catch the background, look at the survey, the survey that land, the survey uh, this book, and to see the background, the scenery, the who, what, where, when, and how. You know, and, and when you're able to look through the proper lens you're able to kind of view the book in the proper way. Who was that written to? When was it written? Why was it written? You know, what was the motivation behind that? Because of who wrote it, how important is that? Were they actually walking with Jesus or did they hear that story secondhand? I mean, all these little questions that you may have, it's good to survey that book to give you an idea of the approach you should take when you read it. 27 books make up this New Testament. Do we know about our 27 books? You know, we're, gonna, we're traveling through these books chronologically. So we're, we have a, a, an order that you may not be used to because what we've learned is Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. It didn't happen in that way. No, it actually didn't. They weren't written and added that way. So when we kind of look at the chronological order, sometimes that makes sense too. You know, you see John wrote very late. That's why the way that he wrote was just such a loving view because all he learned about relationships. And when we get to John, whoo, the water works because you look at what it took for him to get to where he was to write what he wrote. It's like, wow. So look at what we've gone through so far here. You know, Matthew, Mark, and Galatians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, James, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, uh, and la last week, uh, Nick did 1st and Corinthians. And today, we are going to journey into the book of Romans. Actually, this is my very, very favorite book in the entire Bible. Uh, so I was super excited. I wish I had a couple hours, but I only have an hour and a half for this sermon. So we'll have to shorten it up, but uh, I'm just kidding. So Romans was written approximately 56 AD. And, uh, you know... When you travel to Rome, these are the things that you see. It's exciting to know that this stuff really happened. You know, and you get to climb these ruins, but they're still standing. And these Colosseums and these exciting views. Uh, the population uh, in this time that it was written uh, was about one million. That is a massive city in that time. It's a million people in, in, in this time was no one would even believe it until they got there, that there were so many people in one place. Kind of like, have you ever been to New York City? I remember going to New York City for the first time. I was actually 19 years old. And I remember driving into New York City, and I didn't, I mean, I knew that New York was big, but I didn't realize how big New York was until I got to look up and see buildings. And you almost fall over, you know? And I don't know if you've ever stood up right up next to the Empire State Building. And like touch the wall and then you go, ah. I mean, you just see this, these massive constructions, you know? And, and this is how people felt when they came to Rome. I cannot believe they built a Colosseum. I can't believe they built this, these massive buildings. There was a huge difference between, a difference between classes there. There were uh, rich lived on the hills surrounding the city in, a lar in large homes. And they had slaves and servants, and we kind of think about how we are. We're in the suburbs. They were kind of in the suburbs, you know. They would overlook the city because of these beautiful views, but they didn't live in the city. The poor lived in the city in small huts. 
So they wanted to make sure that they were immediately, they would be immediately be able to make money, to be able to beg for food, and to take care of their needs. Uh, the Roman mob ran the games, the chariot races, the gladiator fights, slaves and servants. It was, this was a part of culture. You know, when we say the word slave or we say the word servant, it didn't mean the same thing in the first century. This was a job. This was a way of life. This was fourth, fifth, sixth generation of those who had been trained for a certain position. And they were well taken care of for the most part. They weren't mistreated the way that we think of slavery. First century is a lot different than what we have in our American history. So when I say the word slave or when you read the word slave in the Bible, um, it was rare that a slave was mistreated the way that we think of today. They were well taken care of because it was a part of a caste society. You know, they, they weren't allowed to, to move on uh, or, or to, to raise up and get an education and get out of their, you know, their, their level. It was a caste society. You were born into that level of society. And you were also born into the wealthy society. And I'll tell you, most of the trouble and most of the murders and most of the killing happened at the higher parts of society, not the lower parts of the society. So the drama was what we read about in the Bible. We see, wait a second, wow, the pressures of being born into a certain caste system were, it was, it was, it had developed an entire culture. This is what they lived in. So when Jesus walked around, he wanted to make sure that he went through all the different sections of culture. It's pretty cool when you see it with the correct lens um, and you see how loving he was and how controversial it was for him to connect from top to bottom because you just didn't do that. Um, so there was a large difference between classes and that was kept that way and that's how the first century was. Uh, you had emperors talk about drama. Huh. Uh, the emperors, um, some good, some bad, uh, you're an emperor for life. And that sounds good, but many emperors were assassinated. Uh, so because it was an occupational hazard to be an emperor, because if you weren't popular or you didn't do the things that your leadership around you wanted you to do, then they'd say, well, you're emperor for life and your life's over. And they would take you out and you'd get a new emperor. Uh, that's kind of how it was. They were the epitome of a politician. Most of uh, their uh, motivation came from self. They were, they were self-driven. They wanted stuff for themselves. Uh, they, were, they would abuse the population anytime that they had an opportunity to gain power, to gain uh, 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 momentum uh, for their armies. Uh, so you never really, they're very, it's very unpredictable to live under an emperor because he could wake up that morning and just have a bad hair day. Hello. And then blast with his anger. Um, uh, Rome was a world power. Uh, trade and commerce came from everywhere. Businesses and shops would open every day. The marketplace was full of action. You know, it was, it was one of those, the city that never sleeps. Again, kind of like New York. There was always something going on in Rome. It had the largest marketplace in the world. And they were known for that. So people would travel from all distances to be a part of their marketplace, to come and sell goods and services, but also to go shopping, right? You know what I mean? So you wanted to find a new pair of Nike sandals? You would go, let's go to Rome, the marketplace. I know that they've got them by now, you know, the new Jordan, whatever. Okay. Probably not Jordan, but anyway, I digress. Um, but this is what Rome was known for, entertainment and culture. You know, this is what separated Rome from all the other parts of the world. Huge coliseums. They could be seen from everywhere in Rome, from all over. You know, like our football and baseball stadiums, you know, when you drive into a town and you see, I don't know if you've dreamt, when you drive into Tampa, you can't help but see, you know, the stadiums. When you drive into Miami, you can't help but see, I don't know what, uh, Sun Life Stadium, I'm not sure, Landshark Stadium, Joe Robbie Stadium, whatever they're calling it today. <laughs> But when you drive in, you see the big stadiums. That's kind of how it was when you came into Rome. You know, you'd see these big stadiums and, and all of these huge buildings. It was a really, it was an experience. Uh, they had concert halls, kind of like our today's movie theaters, you know, where they would have plays and people would speak and teach. Uh, prominent speakers would stand up and give these lectures on philosophy and modern thinking. Maybe some of these names will resonate with you. Uh, Lucius, Ananias, uh, Seneca, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of him, but a very uh, popular philosopher of the time. Uh, Gaius Rufus, 
Uh, Rufus was, would stand up. Piney the elder, you, you know, um, uh, Perseus would stand up and they would give these speeches. And they also had disciples, people that would sit at their feet and learn and try to speak like them and teach like them. They had big following. So when they would stand up, crowds would gather, listen, wow, what, wonder, wonder what they're going to teach us. Uh, they had these bathhouses where men uh, went at the end of the day after work and they would exercise. So they would actually have these gymnasiums where men would belong to, just like what we have today here, and they would go work out and work on their bodies and try to be fit. Um, just definitely not, in, no, no other culture really did this. Rome was way ahead of their time. It made them feel inferior. Uh, you know, you have these Roman soldiers walking around, and they were big, and they were fit, and they were made to lift things and work out, maybe not the same way we would work out today, but for what they could figure out and how to stay fit, they would do that. So then the kids would watch that. Man, I want to be like a soldier. And they would. So you started to, to have a population of people that wanted to be fit and strong. They would go to war a lot too. Rome went to war. So they were, it was a very popular thing to do is to, to, to have these visions of grandeur. You know, wow, man, Rome is so awesome. There's such a power. I want to be a part of it. They were sophisticated and cultured. It was a very cool place to be. And on top of that, there were a good number of Jews that lived there. Forty to 50,000 of their population were Jews. So they had temples and, uh, you know, in different parts of the marketplace that were dedicated to their type of shopping. Uh, if you know, it had to be cult, uh, uh, kosher. So, you know, they, they had kosher marketplaces and their own uh, culture and society that they had built within Rome. Um, but another thing that Rome, of course, is very uh, known, well known for is their religion. Uh, it was interesting. Different level of religious leadership, all very political and very mystical. When you start reading about their religion, it's almost overwhelming to think about what they practiced and what they taught uh, and the things that they would do, the compromises that they would make. Uh, you know, so they had, uh, they, they would have, um, Basically, the Greek word for this is prionizate, prionizate, or schooled physician of thinking. So they would school you in the understanding of how to see nature, okay? They had this, something that's called the king of sacred things, okay? So he would perform uh, these sacrifices on behalf of Rome to all these different gods, and what they would do is they would watch uh, nature, and they would see how a bird would fly. And they would say, okay, if the bird flies to the right, that means that we're going to make a certain decision to go to war against a certain type of people. And so, or if a lightning bolt would come down in a certain way, then they would say, that's the gods telling us to go in this direction and make this types of decisions. So it was very kind of like this nature theme to their society that they would watch nature and try to understand it. And the philosophers would try to figure out why you know, a leaf would fall in a certain direction. It must mean something. And they would tie that to some type of religious way of life. Uh, and it was constant. It was all over the place. And people were completely into it. Uh, they would even have sacrifices to the gods of, of those they conquered. Just in case, because they didn't want bad karma. They didn't want something bad to happen to them if they didn't honor the god of the people that they took over. This was their society. Um, they had over 420 uh, temples built to different gods in Rome. So take your pick. Who would you like, you know, <laughs> what kind of religion would you like to be a part of, you know? Um, so it was, a, it was a, a melting pot of culture, architecture, popularity, politics, strange religious practices. Every type of person from all over the known world came through Rome. Every caste, every part of caste society was in Rome. Paul believed, and this is why Paul believed so strongly that Rome was the key to getting the gospel of Jesus to the world. He felt that if we could just get the gospel to Rome properly, then the entire world would be evangelized. He had a strong conviction. You remember, he, he wrote in his letters, he wanted to get to Rome. He wanted to get back to Rome. He wanted to make sure that Rome had a proper teaching of Jesus. So, what type of church do we have in Rome? Multicultural, right? Of course, right? From old school Jew to the teachers of the law and Pharisees that have come to Christ 
to those who thought the Torah was a joke and everything in between, every caste society. Now they're being taught. What are they being taught? We're all equal before the cross. Wow. I mean, this multicultural, countercultural group getting together, loving one another the way that God designed it to be. What a safe haven. Can you imagine? It's kind of like when I walked in here. All the levels left, finally. The world just kind of faded away, and I got to just be among my brothers and sisters. You know, we're all one. We're all in this together before God, and it's just awesome, and I love it. And these people would walk in and go, finally, the pressures of Rome are off me. I get to come into a place where we can love each other equally. You know, um, and you had every, you know, from very devout and religious to complete heathen becoming Christians. You know, Uh, those who became disciples could be from very different views of Yeshua or or the Messiah. So the basic categories are Jews who became disciples of Jesus. Then you had Gentiles who had fully converted to Judaism and then became followers of Jesus. And then you had Gentiles who had been in the process of converting to Judaism but accepted Jesus before that happened, before they finished their proselyte training or whatever you want to call it. And then absolute pagan or modern thinking becoming a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, all of them repentant and baptized disciples of Jesus. If this wasn't complex enough, imagine leading this church. If this weren't complex enough, the RCOC, Roman Church of Christ, um, was meeting within the framework of the synagogue system still. Why? Well, they were in regular contact and discussion with non-Jesus believing Jews. This was awkward, a little controversy, because the followers of Christ were not allowed to be followers of Christ yet. They couldn't be their own religion, so they had to be underneath the synagogue. Awkward. Why? Well, the synagogue's trying to pressure them to worship there, but the Christians didn't believe in the way that they saw God. They said, well, no, wait, Yeshua has come. The Messiah has arrived. A little awkward. But this was the state that they were in. So even though The Jews, historically, were the chosen people of Israel for thousands of years, right? Even though they have been waiting their whole life for Yeshua to come, they had the right of passage, not the Gentiles. God is now saying, I want everyone. No one is righteous. All fall short. All are separated by sin. Gentile and Jew alike. And I think all of us can go, yeah, amen. Amen. We look around the room and go, yep, sin, sin, sinner, 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 and yep, sinner, need a savior, yep. But that caused a lot of controversy within the church. There was a lot of pressure to, to really get, I mean, I know how I am. When I struggle, I go back to who I am. I don't know about you. I don't struggle with new things. It's very rare. I struggle with old things. Satan knows exactly what button to push. And that's what makes it embarrassing when we confess sin, right? Here I go again. Here's my same struggle. We shouldn't be surprised. Of course it's the same struggle because that's your flesh. And, you're try, you know, in, in our natural, you know, tendency is to go back to that. And we go back to that, then we fall into sin again. And then we got to go, oh, man, I'm weak again in this department. I need help. Of course you're weak in that department. That's probably that button that you'll have until the day that you die, the thorn. You know, Nick talked about the thorn last week. So, I have no idea where I'm at. So, you had the Jews, they had to be humble enough to believe this. And the Gentiles had to be humble enough to recognize that they were now going to worship the God of Israel only. You see what I mean? So, a lot's coming, going on in this church, Romans 10. Uh, Romans 10, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. That was a huge uh, situation that Paul had to deal with. There's no difference between you guys. You guys call on the same Lord. It's the same Jesus, same Lord, same baptism. Everything's the same. Guys, stop fighting. Stop bickering. Stop arguing on who's better, who's, who's got, got it all figured out. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. Yeah. On top of that, it was the city of Rome. <laughs> it had every sin to offer, every struggle, every possible religion to be a part of. Every comfort to offer you. Divorce was as common as marriage in Rome. All you actually had to be is declared divorced. Change religion as often as you change your socks. You had 420 different 
options on Sunday morning. Hmm, which one we'd like to go to today? Homosexuality was not uncommon. Hmm. Boy, doesn't that sound familiar? You know, there's a reason why the book of Romans is my favorite book is I think it was written to the United States. It was written to my people. <laughs> I'm telling you, I feel a lot of what Paul uh, tries to get across to the, the church in Rome, he's getting, trying to get across to us here. Uh, there's so much, we have so much in common uh, with, with Rome. Um, so, have you caught on to what the setting is here? Yes. Yeah, me too. Uh, what was Rome like? What was the RCOC like, the Roman Church of Christ? What it must have taken to become a disciple in Rome, either Jew or Greek, and to remain a disciple in Rome? It's the toughest place to be, the most temptations, the hardest walk. So you could see why Paul's like, man, if we could just get the proper gospel to Rome, things will, will go a lot better for us because they kind of touch all parts of society. So here we go. The Apostle Paul writes this book to the Romans, to this church in Rome. He was about to leave for Jerusalem to Corinth, uh, from Corinth. Okay, and this is Romans 15, verse 25 on his third missionary trip. So a little, this is a little, little over 25, uh, 20 years after the day of Pentecost. So to kind of give you an idea of the timeline. And yes, so 20 years of the church growing, changing, evolving, falling, compromising, and all the drama entering, 20 years of that developing. And so this is what Paul is facing. The book of Romans is, is mostly a compendium, okay, or his magnum opus. Basically, Paul's teaching is detailed collection of information. Very detailed, and you'll notice that. Very detailed teachings, very specific. Very, he explains things very well. Not so much an emotional or inspired type of writing, although he does get emotional uh, in some parts. He, you, hear, you can hear it through his writing, but it's more of a summary of what Paul knows. And it's almost like he gathers every single lesson he's ever been taught, has ever learned, and he puts it to paper, and he gives it to Rome, the Roman church. He wants them to know what he knows. So Paul takes on the most controversial issues in the Bible, in the book of, of, of Romans. I don't know if you've noticed that. The, 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 the darkest stuff is in the book of Romans. The hardest things to deal with is in the book of Romans. You know, he covers homosexuality, he covers slavery, he co I mean, all of the controversies going on, he's like, we're going to talk about it. <laughs> How you doing today? Here's your letter. You know what I mean? You're going to deal with it in the church. It's not going to live there. You've got to repent. And he's calling this church to make change. The book of Romans, so thick with content, so rich with teaching. And, um, and really, this book has also ca caused massive changes of renewals, revivals, changes in the Christian population more than any other book. There, it's said that if you get Romans, Roman gets, Romans gets you. It's that book. If you could just get your heart and your mind around Romans, God's got you. And that's awesome. It's awesome. So that gives you the backdrop, kind of a little survey of the book of Romans. And now... Um, I, want you, I want you to look at one of my favorite parts of the book of Romans. It's a very popular spot, but I want to kind of show you something, maybe something that maybe you haven't seen. So, the book of Romans. All right. Go into a pharmacy. All right. The druggist takes several different drugs. He mixes them together and he makes a medicine. Now, some of the chemicals he uses are deadly by themselves. But when he mixes them together, he puts the right ingredients together, they heal. You know, this is how God works. He takes our problems, right, our situations that look terrible on the outside. Can I get an amen from that? Like, what, sometimes we get stuck on one situation, some mistake that we've made, and it feels like the end of the world is on its way. I don't know if you can understand. Woo! You know, we feel like it's over. It's too big. Any of these problems by themselves may kill us. But he mixes that, those problems, that problem, with his own ingredient, Jesus. And he produces something that actually heals us. Isn't that amazing? 
So he takes all that, those problems, he takes the mistakes, and he mixes them with Jesus, and all of a sudden, now we've got a special medicine that actually saves us. So, he can take a life that is headed to disaster and flip it over and it becomes good. And that's Romans 8.28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been, a call, who have been called according to his purpose. So, point number one in my small sermon Oh, we're doing fine. That's right. I'm going to take all of them. Someone falls out of a window, I'm going to try to heal them. I'm going to ask someone else to help me, though. Okay. So we know in all things he will work for the good. No questions, no qualifications. God doesn't need to be quantified or, or measured, right? We can't measure God. Ask God, hey, will you come through? Whoa, really? I find myself doing that sometimes, and maybe you look back going, oh, whoa, wait a second. He will catch you because he promises that he will catch you. He is ironclad. Those promises will not change. This is from the creator himself. Look what Joshua says here, 23 verse 14. You know with all your heart and soul that no not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. One of my favorite things to do is go through the Old Testament, look at all the predictions, and look at all the fulfillments that happen in the New Testament. It's so faith-building. And it's not, you know, sometimes you kind of like, you're reaching, and maybe there are a few that, Theologians have tried to tie that it seems like the Bible, you know, they're trying to make the Bible say something that it doesn't. But there are hundreds that are just right in your face. They're so obvious. It's so obvious that God fulfilled his promise. And they just happen to be the big ones. Right. You know? Because his reputation depends on his word being perfect. All things will work for the good. So am I certain of his promises? When I ask myself, am I certain, am I sure that God will come through with his promises? F.B. Meyer, he says he's a Christian writer. He says, if any promise of God should fail, the heavens would clothe themselves in sackcloth. The sun, the moon, and the stars would reel from their courses. The universe would rock, and a hollow wind would moan through a ruined creation at the awful fact that God can lie. God cannot lie. This is what I asked my daughters as they were little. I said, you know, could God take that rainbow away if he wanted to? It's a trick question. Well, of course, he can't. He cannot do that because he cannot lie. He prom that's a promise that he has in the sky for us forever. And... It just is what it is. God can't lie. He can't take it away. Does he have the power? He has the power to do whatever he wants, but he can't lie. So you want to give that to your little ones just to kind of remind them, wait a second, God can't lie. He can't not come through. It's not, he's not genetically made that way. He hasn't made himself that way. He can't do it. He won't do it. Hebrews 6.18 tells us that it is impossible for God to lie. Titus 1, 2 reads, our faith and knowledge rest on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. So even before time started, God said, I won't lie. You can trust me. God is trustworthy. Point number two, the Almighty is all about the all. He's all about the all. Back in Romans 8, 28, it says, in all things, not most. So if he said most things, we would go, eh. No, in all things, all things. Not so, but all, everything in our life, God is working for the good. Even the things you don't understand or the things that you don't like. Even the disasters and the defeats in your life, God is working for the good. Here's some things to think about, okay? Blessings work for our good. Isn't that awesome? We love the blessings, right? That's easy. 
home, family, friendships, health, wealth, salvation. We like this stuff. And we want that to work for our good, right? Hey, prove to me, God, that you love me, and he comes through, and, you work, and wonderful things happen, and you go, yeah, it should cause me to be better for him, to want to be better for him. Romans 2, 4, it says, do you, not, do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience? Not really realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. God's kindness leads us to repentance. Isn't that awesome? That's what we want, right? Be kind, God, and I'll follow you. But he also works in all things, even the sorrowful things work for our good. Oh, no. Yes, the sorrowful things, and maybe you feel more like this. Sorrowful things, oh, confusing. It can be tough going through hard times and keeping this conviction, right? Earthquake in Japan, killing of Christians in India and the Middle East, tsunamis, hurricanes, tornadoes, car accidents, job loss, divorce, financial destruction, sickness, all for the good. Amen. Yeah, amen. But it can be confusing. Hundreds of examples are in the Bible where very sorrowful things happen and it all works out for the good in the end. You notice that? It's almost like God waits to the last second. It's like a Hollywood movie sometimes. And it's like four, three, two, one, and then God comes through and he's like, see? Wow. Daniel's kidnapped and brought to an enemy country, right? Impact. After Daniel comes out of the lion's den unharmed, look what King Darius says in Daniel 6, verse 26. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. Did you ever see that coming? That the very king would stand up and, and make a law that they had to follow God. Wouldn't that be awesome One of it happened in one of our times together? Could you imagine? At the end of the service, and the president comes in, and he goes, I'm going to make a rule. Every single person in the United States has to become a disciple. Wouldn't it be great? I don't know. Maybe it would be. <laughs> Look like Rome. I don't know. Impact. David, Psalm 119, 71, it was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. Do we have that conviction? It was good for me to go through this hard time so that I can have a deeper understanding of who God is. I can learn who he really is. Do we really understand God when we're not afflicted, when we're not going through hard times? Wow. It's hard to learn trust if everything is always kittens and rainbows. You know what I'm saying? Um, Joseph, look at his reaction here. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You know, do we have that conviction? What's going on in my life right now, the hard times that I'm going through right now will produce fruit one day. It will help me to have impact on this dying world. All, all things for the good of those who love him. Amen. Even satanic things. We learned that last week, didn't we? Nick talked about that thorn. Who was the thorn from? Satan. Whoa. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. You guys have your Bibles with you? All right. It's live church. I can see you. Busted. No Bible, no Bible, no Bible. Let's get this on camera. I'll read it to you. It's all good. Just happy to be together. I love my Bible home. All right. Glad I have it, right? Imagine if I had forgot mine. All right. 12 verse 2. I know a man in Christ. Nope. 12 verse 7. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power might rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, 
then, then I am strong. Wow, Paul endured a satanic attack and affliction to get strong, to get gains. Like, Paul went through hard times and he understood it so that he can gain things. So he can become powerful. So his weaknesses, God flipped it. And he said, wait a second, the more I rely on God because of my weaknesses, the stronger I really am. So what did Paul learn? Surrender. He's like, wait a second, the more I surrender and the quicker I surrender, the stronger I am. Hey, I learned a trick. Watch this. Stop pretending to be someone that you're not. Stop acting like, so. you know what I mean? Stop pretending that you're not a sinner. Just be a sinner. Confess it. Do what you got to do to get right with God. Do the right thing. Let God work on your heart. Work on those weaknesses and all of a sudden gains. You're like spiritually, you know, even showing the back, right? The bodybuilders. Gains. But do we feel this way? God's going to get me through it and I'm going to have spiritual gains because of it. Do we have to trust God through these times, these hard times, even when Satan is attacking us? All. God uses an evil spirit to change Saul's mind about David. Yeah. Torturing this poor man. Spears being thrown at him. Why? You ever read the Psalms? Yeah. Hmm. What if there's a connection there? God's like, I need these Psalms to be written. <laughs> Here we go. Saul, throw another spear. He's like, ah, you know? How about God using an evil spirit to control Pharaoh? to ever make you struggle? Why? To bring his people out of Egypt. All. You know, he even uses our sin for our good. I shouldn't sin, right? I shouldn't sin. That's not something that we should go out to try to do. But I do sin. And I do it deliberately. You know, I, th I like when we, we use this terminology, I fell into sin. <laughs> the bottom line is, I chose to bite that apple. Yeah, I know I shouldn't have, but I did. It was tempting. That's why I did it. I was weak. I did it. But at the end of the day... I chose to do it, deliberate, on purpose, and I find myself choosing my sin over God. I don't know about you. I hope I'm not the only one in the room that's related to this, but God can take my deliberate sin and use it for my good. What? Turn the Bible over to Luke. Luke chapter 22 and verse 31. Listen to this. You catch this. This is Jesus talking to Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, oh, man, he turned away. When you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Whoa. Who stood up and opened the way into heaven in Acts 2? Peter. Would Peter have ever had the conviction to do that if he didn't go through what he, what he went through? I don't know. Maybe not. But God used it for good. He used it for strength. Peter. How about Romans 7, 14? You ever read Romans 7, 14? It's one of my favorite parts in the Bible. You know why? Because I can finally relate to Paul. <laughs> Romans 7 and verse 14 says, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. Ah, it's like we have a disease and it's called sin. Verse 18, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature naturally. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me 
that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. You ever feel that? Might feel that right now. When is this guy going to be over? When is this going to end? I'm hungry. Who was it that wrote the book of Romans? Paul. Who was it that discipled the first century churches? Paul. <laughs> oh, yeah, Paul. Look what he got through. Look what God used. His sin, murder, to bless the churches. You think he can use you? Yeah, but I'm too sinful. Murder, to bless the churches. Wow. All things. Not just the things that you think are going to be useful to God. God's going to use it all. He wants it all. All the circumstances of our life for the good. We may not see the good right now. You may not see it right now. You may think, mm, no, he's not talking about me right now. And I'm hiding all these things and no one's ever going to. God knows exactly what's going on. And he's using it to try to make something good. It's a mind bender, I know. But the Almighty is all about the all. He's not about some. He's about everything. Point number three, told you. God is God. Duh. But he is able to take control of every situation in life. Look at some of these scriptures. Deuteronomy 10, verse 17. For the Lord, your God, is God of gods and Lord of lords. See, I didn't make that up. The great God, mighty and awesome. Look at Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to his power that is in work with us. Urgh, yes. Deuteronomy 10, 14 reads, To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. It's God's. He's in control of that. Psalm 24, 1 through 2. Look at this. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world, and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Which, of course, takes us right back to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We should have got a clue from the very first <laughs> book and the very first verse. God is in charge. Amen. We can't forget that. He has the final say in how everything turns out. So when you think you're being sneaky right now, when you think you're flying under the radar, God's not oblivious to what's going on, and he's setting you up right now. He, he knows the end of every decision that you will ever make, and it looks like a big bowl of spaghetti to us. Trail after trail and wind after wind, and we'll never figure out which way to go. God's like, I know it all. I created it. I know the end of every decision, and I'm just trying to set you up right now. Are we going to surrender? And let him use his power in our life. But there's a condition. Okay? Notice, a lot of things that we subscribe to or that we purchase, we've got to push this button. How many of us read all of the <laughs> terms and conditions? Well, you probably want to read this one. Just saying. Okay, just saying. Because it's pretty hefty. Um, but here's the thing. Here's the condition. It reads, Romans 8, Romans 8, 28, in all things God works for the good of those who love him. So we think it's the good of everybody. No. I mean, what kind of relationship do we have with God? Can you say you love God? Well, of course I emotionally love him. Well, let's talk about it for a second. How can I tell if I really love God? First, do I know God? Do I know him? Do I know his word and what it says? See, I can say I know you, but if I don't know anything about you, then I don't know you. Right? You ever get with somebody and they call you, you're their best friend? Oh, they're, they're my best friend. And you're going, best friend? You don't even know my, the names of my kids. You know what I'm saying? Like, how do you? Best friend. Sometimes we go, God, I love you. You're my best friend. God's like, you don't even know my. Please, best friend. Not that he would smirk like me, but. So do I know God? Do I read about him? Do I search in how and what he loves, why he loves it, what he hates, and what he just despises? Do we, I mean, sometimes we continue to do things that God despises because we don't know he despises it so much. 
would probably get on his nerves, right? What makes him happy? What makes him sad? Do I please him? It's all right here, B-I-B-L-E. It's a book for me. I got to get to know him. Then, are we obedient to what we read? See, part one is that, do we know it? But then part two is, are we going to listen? Are we going to do it? There's our test. Uh, uh, John 14, 21, what, this is what Jesus says. Whoever has my commands and obeys them. This is an underline. If you want to turn to it, underline it. Whoever has my commands and obeys them. I don't know if I wrote this down. I did. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. That's John 14, 21. But look at 1 John, same writer. About the same time it was written, a little bit later, not much. This is love for God, to obey his commands. God has a love language. You know what it is? Obedience. You want to know how you love God? Get to know what he says and then do it. And God goes, I feel so loved. Isn't that awesome? So we may know the commands, but do we obey them? 1 John 5, 3, it reads, this is love for God, to obey his commands. Wow. So I've got no right to claim Romans 8, 28, unless I love God. Make sense? That's my condition. So I'll ask us again, do you love God? Can you prove it through the scriptures? Okay. Sometimes we've got some work to do. So Romans 8, 28, it's not designed for happiness. You ever notice that? Bunnies, puppies, kittens. It's not to be taken lightly. Uh, verse 28 uh, through 30, it reads, and if you want to turn there, be great, but I'm going to try to get through this. It says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Listen, and those he predestined, he also called, those he called, he also justified, those he justified, he also glorified. God's purpose in turning Everything to good is not to make me happy or comfortable or wealthy or to put me on easy street. It's to make me more like Jesus. You see, I think some of us, we want, if it fits into our comfort zone, if it's convenient for us, then we really like this scripture. But how much are we allowing God to work us into being like Jesus? How much are we pushing that away? God didn't finish with me at baptism. He didn't just say, hey, you're saved. That's good. Get back to doing what you're doing. He continues to shape me until I'm just like his son. And he will not rest until that happens. James 4.14, it says, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. This is God's perspective. He's going to do whatever it takes to get me to him before it ends. He loves me. He desires to be with me forever. He wants to glorify me. Wow. And when was Jesus glorified? Well, it was in his, in his resurrection, and he returned to God when the job was complete, right? And he will use anything and everything to get me and you to him before that is complete. It comforts me, but it also scares me a little bit, yeah. right? Because my aim is not for just good things. My aim is to get something out of every single lesson, out of every part of my life. Imagine a, a diamond cutter. He takes this piece of coal. He chips away slowly, removing all the impurities, dirt, grime, and filth. But every strike, every chisel, every vigorous and strenuous step seems harsh and looks to make this rock even worse. But with every strike and every blow from the hammer and chisel, the impurities are removed. The sparkle begins to show one edge and, and then another. And then the top of the diamond shows its beautiful face. And before long, this once piece of coal that only a diamond cutter would even know would be a diamond becomes the most prized commodity. And to the diamond cutter, it was worth all the work. You know, God looks at us, and he doesn't see what we see. We see the here and now. God sees what we will be. He sees what we would look like if we would just allow him to hammer and chisel us. God's trustworthy. 
God's all about the all. He uses the good, the bad, and the ugly in our life. Amen? God is God. Complete control. And the condition is that we must love Him. And the outcome? It's not for our comfort. It's to be like Jesus. And in the end, to be like God and with God for eternity. Everything in our life is working for the good. Book of Romans. Next week, Omar is going to be showing us the gospel of Luke. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and we're going to say a prayer for communion. Great. Father, uh, I'm just grateful that we can come together as a family and take communion. It's been a long time since we've been able to sit next to one another and enjoy the connection that we have because of what Jesus did for each one of us. Father, I pray as, uh, as we take uh, the juice and, uh, and the bread represents Jesus' body and blood shed for us, that we will have a connection that maybe we've never had before. We'll make decisions right now that maybe we haven't, because we come to the realization that everything in us, every, every mistake, every good thing, every bad, is all put together for something good in the end. Help us to trust you, help us to surrender, and Father, help us to appreciate what Jesus did for us at this, at this time. We love you. We are so grateful for the way that you love us and take care of us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we have been uh, doing contactless contribution for some time. Um, and if you wanted to give in person right now, there's actually a giving box that we have uh, installed right next to the sound uh, booth over there that uh, you can put it in an envelope and put your name on it. If it's a check, you can just fold it and drop it in there. Uh, but you also are welcome to give the same way that you've been giving online. Uh, that's fine too. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and say a, a prayer for the contribution. Father, uh, I thank you so much that we were able to, to meet together tonight, and it really, uh, to be able to, to do what we did for a year, uh, it amazes me to, to see how much we were able to stay in contact, and, and really, our giving is, uh, has produced that ability to do that, and produced uh, the ability to come back together, and, 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 and really uh, created an environment where we can uh, feel confident and secure in. 
uh, but also that we can continue to connect with you and bring others with us to connect with you as well. Uh, Father, I pray that you'll bless our giving right now and help it to multiply and go to the places where you have designated it to go, Father. We love you. We thank you. Please bless this time uh, that we have to give. It's such an honor and privilege uh, to do this as a family. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, please stand. We've got uh, one closing song. If you notice these little stickers on me, it's because little Ethan was taking great delight in putting them on me during the sermon. And I was afraid if I removed them, it might upset him. So uh, this, is one, this is one of my favorite songs, uh, As Many As Possible. Oh, and I really need you to sing out, especially during the end. Though we are free from all men, we choose to be slaves again. Do it all possible, as many as possible, for Jesus Christ has won. Lift high the cross to every man. On Jesus' word, take your stand. To win all possible, as many as possible, for Jesus Christ has won. Every nation is pleading, crying out for an answer. Men of courage must rise up again. Where are the mighty men? The kingdom now is at hand. We must become slaves again. To win all possible, as many as possible. For Jesus Christ, the Lord of lords, the King of kings, as one. Good night.